Come on now, let's thank him for it. Come on, do you believe it's done? Not just saying it is, but believing it's done. It is finished. Hallelujah. Oh, I believe it, Lord. I believe it, Lord. I sense the breaking of change right now in this place. I sense the breaking of bondage right now in this house. Set the captain free. Set the captain free, Lord. Yeah. Join hands with your neighbor today. The one to your right, the one to your left. Let us pray as a family today. This atmosphere right now, you can receive your miracle. See, I'm if there's any doubt, I'm not here to develop a social club. I'm here to impose the kingdom of God upon the earth. We are here. The tabernacle of praise exists to impose the kingdom of God upon this region. Not for us to gather together for religious rigors, but to see a manifest power of Christ revealed in our families, revealed in our region, revealed in our nation, in our world. Amen? So you say, well, how, you know, the Bible said that, that we will know if a place is carrying anointing. How do you know if it's carrying anointing? Are yokes being destroyed and our burdens being removed? If yokes are not being destroyed and burdens are not being removed, then there is no anointing because that's what the anointing does amen I won't take a whole lot of time but I just want to tell you Jeremy seen on Facebook no here is uh, after the, our, our time of fasting and prayer went back to the doctor and his eyes have increased in vision to where he doesn't need his prescription anymore Amen. Sister Kathy, Bo and Kathy sent me an email this week of that little Jordan that we've been praying for. Remember her? We prayed for her on prayer service. And the doctors said that she had this, was born with this crippling disease, that she couldn't walk. Her legs were deformed. And they sent word that after we prayed that her legs popped back in and came into alignment. That's the God we're serving. We're not serving a man that has the limitations that you and I have. We are serving an omnipotent God that created us and is able to speak life into dead situations. And even though it may be past us and it may already be dead and beyond our ability, when he speaks into that situation, even though it is dead, it cannot remain dead because he is life and his words are life. And so it, it may be a dead marriage. It may be a dead circumstance. It may be physically that you're feeling of dead in your body. But I come to prophesy today. I come to speak into your dead situation and say live in the name of the Lord. I speak to that marriage and say live in the name of the Lord. I speak to your body today that's racked with pain and I say live in the name of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you now. Receive that word of the Lord. Receive the anointing of God. Accept his favor upon your life. Hallelujah. Come on, join hands with somebody quickly in this atmosphere now. Spirit of the living God, we come together. We join our faith together now for my brother on my right, my sister on the left. And I speak blessing upon them now. 
I speak life into their situation that may seem dead and dormant. But Spirit of the living God, breathe upon them now. Breathe upon their situation and their circumstance. And that which is beyond our ability, just breathe fresh life into them now in the name of Jesus. God, it may be a spiritual relationship that today they've drawn cold and indifferent in you. But I pray in this atmosphere you breathe life into them now in the name of Jesus and allow your glory to be revealed. We thank you for the testimonies that have already come, but with expectation we believe you for testimonies to come of your great power. And Father, if you'll bless my brother or my sister today, I'll praise you like you blessed me. And I'll give you praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. And amen, amen, amen. Come on and bless him right here. Hallelujah. Come on and bless him this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. I hear in the spirit somebody says, I wish you'd pray for the sick. I just did. You just need to receive your healing. Amen. I said, I just did. We just did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Just allow his anointing to breathe upon you. Hallelujah. To whom the sun sets free. He is free indeed. Whom the sun sets free. He is free indeed. Come on, you got to help me. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Whom the sun sets free, receive it now. I'm free. Whom the sun sets free is is free indeed. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Oh, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. There's nothing like being free. I'm free. Yes, I'm free. There's nothing like. Free when the sun sets free, it's free indeed. When the sun sets free, it's free indeed. Yeah. One more time, when the sun sets free, it's free indeed. When the sun sets free, it's free indeed. Oh, I'm free. Come on and give him the ovation of the morning. Come on, put a clap with your shout and a shout with your clap. Hey, we bless you, oh Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We bless you, oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Slap your neighbor a high five. Tell him you're looking better already. May be seated today. Praise God. I can't stand dead church. Amen. 
Jesus couldn't even show up at a funeral because dead things come back to life. And if Jesus be here, come on somebody. Amen. If Jesus be here, then we ought to act like we got some life. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank God for Calvary. Thank God we have a place where His Spirit can move. Amen. And minister to us. It isn't about the parades of the flesh. You don't have to wait on personalities for God to move. God uses His gifts and we honor the gifts. We don't celebrate people. We don't, uh, you know, worship people, but we celebrate the gift. Amen. Because God uses people to minister to us. Amen. And so we, we're thankful for that. But we will honor the Holy Spirit as he ministers to us. And so uh, thank God for that. Amen. Thank God for that. I want to uh, start a series today that's going to perhaps push on you uh, just a little bit. But we're going to be talking about step it up. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, it looks like to me you could step it up. Ah, oh, come on, you scaredy cat. Look at him. Tell him, looks like to me you could step it up. <laughs> I know what you're saying, Pastor. You don't have to go home with him. Uh, uh, amen. I want to start today and uh, told staff and those at the media, I said, I will start back it up for next week, but as I was praying uh, yesterday in just direction, I couldn't get this out of my spirit, so we're going to start today instead of a three-week series, we'll have a four-week series, but I want, want to step it up. I want to talk today, a subtitle today is Busy Going Nowhere, Busy Going Nowhere. I want to look at two portions of scripture today. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 20. Understanding if this is a prophetic word about the end times. And then the two ten horns that were on his head. Notice where they were. Horns were on his head. And the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Amen. He says that in this last day there is a spirit that would come to prevail against the saints and wear the saints down. But the Ancient of Days came. The Most High, and He made judgment in favor of the saints. And then I want to go to Mark chapter 5 and the first nine verses there, and then we'll try to put this together. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gadaris. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. No one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broke in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones and when he had saw Jesus from afar he ran and worshipped him 
And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of this man, unclean spirit. And he said to him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. I want to talk to you today and try to bring this together. Talk to you on stepping up, busy, going nowhere. Spirit of God, we thank you for your presence today. Thank you for your word. We ask you that you would help to confirm the word through your spirit today. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I said, over the next few weeks, we will be preparing for a harvest that God will entrust to us. Preparation always precedes the blessing. Someone has to dig the ditches before the provision comes. Someone has to build the ark before the first raindrop ever falls. Someone has to build the barn to take care of the harvest and to the proportion in which they build the barn, the harvest will come. So over the next few weeks, I want to preach this perhaps challenging series entitled Step It Up. And there are ways that we can all step it up. Can you say amen? Uh, for there is something that we can all do a little better. There's something we can adjust. There's something we can shift or change so that we can be able to do a thing better. I understand that everyone is in different stages of life. And those are different life stages that we have different amounts of time. Uh, whenever you are single, you have the most time or free time that you will ever have in your life. You single and you think you don't have no time, you just hold on, baby. Get married. I got one brave man. Then we have that stage of life married with no kids. This is the funnest time of your life. You're with the love, you're connected with them, and you get to spend all of your time with them. You get to do the things you enjoy. And you don't even have to plan. You can just come home and say, let's go to Smoky Mountains. Okay, that sounds good. Throw some stuff in the suitcase and off the road you're gone. It's fun. It's good. You can stay up all hours of night. You can do a lot of stuff without even planning because you and your spouse are there together and you can enjoy that time together. Then there's the stage of a newborn. Your life is over. You won't get any sleep for six months to a year. They will control and tell you what you're going to do. You can plan a thing, and it'll still change right up on you. Huh? I got anybody got any babies up in here. You can be expecting and planning, and, and all of a sudden, just that, that child can start going crazy, and you ain't going nowhere but to the living room. They're a blessing from the Lord. <laughs> Sometimes you have to remind yourself of that more than others. But they really are a blessing from the Lord. Can I get a witness? And then we have kids that get into school. And then they, they have sports. And so you have school programs. And, and then they start getting into sports. And, and then you have to start this balancing act. 
of how you're going to fit all of this other stuff into your world. And, and so you have this balancing act of, of what is important, what's the top priorities, what, what are we going to do for the next, uh, you know, hopefully 12 years. Uh, how are we going to fit all of this in to our family and to our life? And how are we going to bring balance into uh, sports and school and, 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 and the church? And how is all of that going to happen? And then you have that stage of grown children, grown kids, where that once again you have time for you and your spouse and you have more time for the things that you really enjoy doing. Not that you don't enjoy your kids. But you have more time for different things in your life. Different life stages, we have more time than others. We just have to determine what we're going to do with that time that we have. If it may be a hard pill to swallow, but we will always give time to the things we value the most. What gets your time? And if you look at your calendar, you can determine what is a priority in your life. We live in a time when we can do things faster than we've ever been able to do them before. And yet, nobody has any time. Everyone is busy, and no one has any time. Anything you talk, anyone that you talk to, from the youngest to the eldest, you ask them, how are you doing? And they say, I'm tired. Some folks say, I'm burnt out. And because I try to have good manners, I don't say it in a disrespectful way, but my thought is, you got to do something before you can burn out. Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah chapter 40. I told you it was going to be quiet, didn't I? Isaiah chapter 40 tells us, you have, not know, have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. His, he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no power, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord. Now he's drawing a parallel here. He's saying that even the young are going to get weary. Even the young men are going to faint. But they that wait upon the Lord and so in other words if we're weary and we're fainting we must not be waiting on the Lord if we don't have any strength could it be that we're not waiting on the Lord but he said they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. It simply means this. If we are willing to invest our time in waiting upon God, He will carry us through some things we would normally have to walk through. So if we are weary, what is draining us? It is not the physical labor for the most part. Because generations past have done a lot more physical labor than what we do today. Amen? I mean, just think about it. They were out there plowing fields with horses and mules. They were out there laboring and, and, and toiling from daylight to dark doing a, a manual labor. 
and working very hard and diligent. And today, I know that there's still some of that left, but now we have all kinds of equipment for everything. And so our, our labor, our physical labor, is not that of what other generations have had to deal with. Amen? But you see, so if it's not physical, it must be mental and spiritual. So one of the encounters that Jesus has with, uh, that is recorded that he has here in Mark chapter 5 when he meets a man that is terrorized by demons. And according to the text, the man lived in the tombs. Not even chains could control him. He was, had a violent behavior that would break out at any given time. And when Jesus confronts that spirit in verse 7, he asks, what is your name? And his response is, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, I know that we are far too sophisticated to take the idea of demons seriously. And yet, the plight of the uh, Gadarian demoniac was, has never been more relevant than what it is in the 21st century. One description of Satan in the New Testament refers to him as the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians 2 and 2. This is an interesting image that, that, that the evil one has been given because when it's interesting to me because the image of evil is an age that we live in where wireless technology has allowed us to be connected wherever we are, whenever we are, even while we are disconnected from those who are with us or around us, we can still get connected to the world. But we're disconnected from who God has called us to become. Living among the tombs seems to be a good description of the time that we spend constantly access to technology that is driving us apart even when we are together. And we create our own alternate reality of who we are. You can talk to a person in the same room as you're in and they don't even hear you because they're in an alternate reality. They have altered what reality is. They have gone somewhere. Their body is sitting in a room, but their mind is far away. We have a different reality. Have you ever watched on Facebook? Somebody you know, and if you did not know them, you would think that bluebirds were singing at their house every day, and it never rained or snowed at their house. The sun was always shining, and they had the perfect family. But since you know them, you read what they are suggesting and scratch your head and say, I see their face, but who is this? Ah, oh, it's quiet up in here. We have created a different reality. We have separated ourselves from the truth of who we are. Amen? Amen. And, and you say, well, pastor, I don't, you know, that sounds a little uh, historic to me and sounds like you're a little old-fashioned or old thought. Well, sometimes you've just got to get back to the real. And we have developed a different reality than who we really are. You know, they have created amusement parks so that you can escape from reality. When you go to an amusement park, money isn't real. Because a Coke that you could buy 
for 75 cents will cost you $10 and you crazy enough to pay it. <laughs> huh? The amusement park, we're out of reality because you see, nobody in their right mind, if, I, if you had to line up out here and wait for 30 minutes to get into this building, I'd be here talking to a camera. But in an amusement park, you go sit in a line for thir- three hours to ride a 30-second ride. There's something wrong with that. Come on. That's the reason why they call me the fun police. Are you with me? I'm not against amusement parks. I'm not against technology. You should enjoy your family. Come on, somebody. We should use technology. We do. But what I'm saying is we have to come back to reality. We have escaped from who we really are. We're not dealing with the real issues in our life. And so therefore we're living in a fantasy world while our real world is falling apart. You see, you can talk to a person in the same room. I tried it today on my way through the, the atrium. There was some children out there playing some games. I said, hey, to them, and ain't one of them looked up. They was all absorbed in those games and their thumbs were gone. Amen? If you want to make some money, get into thumb surgery because we're going to need it, baby. <laughs> Amen. But we escape. We go to another place. We disconnect from reality. Research has shown that our uh, dependence upon technology is even changing our brains. And it's not for the better. In our day and age, we don't have to believe in demons to be given over to despair and destruction. All we have to do is go wireless. We are subject to thousands of different voices that are competing for our time. For we are many. We present images of our lives through the Facebook and Twitter that we have this wonderful reflection of who we are but in reality our lives are falling apart and we need a touch from heaven. Never before have we had so many forms of communication and yet the sense of loneliness and alienation is so profound in this generation. What is your name? Whether or not you believe in the reality of demons, a truthful response to this question for many of us would be legion, for we are many. Many voices, many activities, many interests, many influences that come into our life that are, that are waging against a God and waging against who we really are, pulling for our time, pulling for our talent, pulling for our treasures. Amen. All of these voices are coming at us. You, you need a new iPhone. You've got to have one. What is a new one? S? S5C. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. S5C. S is something and I C is the collar, right? Yeah, okay. You've got to have one of those because if you don't have one of those, you're not cool. You've got to have one of those to keep up with the times. But I want to ask you something. What can you do on that colored cell phone that I can't do on my historic cell phone. But those voices are speaking into our life to take away from us. And we crazy enough to spend $500 for a phone for what? But then we can't tithe. Is 
told you to be quiet. If you can handle this, baby, the rest of this series is going to be a breeze. <laughs> but how many know every once in a while we just got to be real? If you can't be real with yourself, then you're just going to be jacked up all your life. You've just got to come to a place and say, hey, you know what? I've got to be real with myself. I've got to look at myself. There's many voices, many activities, many things, many interests, many influences that are pulling at us. And it's pulling the time away to where we don't even have time to pray. We don't have time to read the word. We don't have time. I find it interesting that the sight of the man being tormented and injuring himself was not what frightened the people. Just like in our day, we have become accustomed to the noise accustomed to the busyness, accustomed to the violence around us until it no longer affects us that we see hurting humanity all around us. It desensitizes us until we no longer care for our hurting brother or sister along the way. It wasn't even these 2,000 pigs that run headlong into the sea that seemed strange to them. Their reality had become so distorted that what become natural is for crazy people to run around in the tombs and cutting themselves. What become normal was the abnormalcy of animals that would take their own lives as they would run into the ocean. And none of that on this generation had affected them that nobody stood up, scratched their head, and said, something's wrong right here. But you know what caused them to weird out? It was when they seen this former demonic sitting next to Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And as soon as they seen that, they said, we got to get this Jesus up out of our city. He's messing things up around here. Come on. And I want to tell you that my concern is pastor. My concern as a leader, my concern as a Christian is that we have lived in this vacuum for so long until we have be, the reality has become distorted, until it has become normal for us not to worship God in spirit and in truth. It has become not normal for God to heal the sick and set the captive free. It's become a strange thing to see signs and wonders and miracles. And when the power of God is revealed, people get weirded out. But I want to tell you it is normal for God to do healings. It's normal for God to do miracles. It's normal for God to break the yokes and remove the burdens and cause the power of a living Christ to be revealed in your life. It's a strange thing for you to serve a God that's not able to deliver you. It's a strange thing for you to worship a God that's not able to heal your body and cause victory to come to your life. Well, I wish I had somebody who would help me right here today. I'm not against technology. Tell your neighbor, pastor's not against technology. Of course I'm not. When I'm gone from home and traveling, I love the fact that I can take this little notebook right here, punch in a number, and wherever I am around the world, I can tune in and see my beautiful wife and children and talk to them face to face. That's awesome. I love the fact that what used to take me hours and weeks to develop a message and reading through all of these books and resources that now it can what used to take weeks could take me hours to pull research and be able to get all everything you can get in a book nearly you can get on this computer that causes your time to be more effective in my study. I just think we need to look at how we are spending our time 
and whose voice we are listening to. Because there are many. We need to be willing to look weird to this culture and just get into his presence and let him speak into my life. I've got to silence all the other voices and I've got to hear him so that my destiny can become fulfilled, so that my purpose becomes pointed, so that my destiny becomes defined and I can walk out his plan, his purpose, his will, and his desire in my life. Let him tell us who we are. Let him tell us what is important in our lives. Let him create our reality. Shut out all the other voices. Shut off the news. They're lying to you anyways. We got the Democrat news, the CNN. And then we got the Republican news, Fox. I guess I'm telling my age a little bit, but I ain't that old to worry about it. But I remember growing up when they would tell you what was going on. Not their twist to what was going on. I remember watching the news as a boy that it was the most boring thing I'd ever seen in my life. Because they sat behind a desk and they reported what was going on. Today, you don't have no idea what's going on because they're telling you what they want you to believe. And, and, and I, I, I'm not a world traveler by any means, but I do know I've been to enough third world countries and I've been to some places and I understand what's going on because you see, the, the, the uh, folks in China, they're as, they're as happy as a, as a coon in a corn patch and the dogs are tied up. Because the Chinese, all they hear is good things about them and bad things about all the other world. And while they're secluded and while they're in a mess, they think they're in a good spot. Amen. Cuba's the same way. They tell the people what they want them to hear and what they want them to believe. Are we not wise enough to understand that's what's happening to us? That all of this foolishness and all of these things that are going on in our world that they are bring, bombarding our minds and our thoughts to try to control us and tell us who we are. Amen. Just like I was telling somebody the other day, this week, I was telling, they was talking about homosexuality and how rampant it was getting. And I said, do you realize that only 4% of America live in a homosexual lifestyle but he said I thought by listening to the news that we was 25-30% I said oh no that's not the reality you've got to shut that stuff off sometimes and you've got to listen to the voice of God that's speaking into our lives we are living in a culture where up is down and down is up and where right is wrong and wrong is right and the church has been caught up in this whirlwind and we have no power to change the culture. But God has not called us to be a, a subculture to this world. He has called us to be a counterculture to this world. And what has become normal and accepted is not normal at all, my brothers and sisters. We, are, we have seen the limitations in America, in the American church, and people in America. We see coming to church as a religious entertainment, religious stimulation, without seeing what God is really trying to do in our lives. You can get saved in America, spend the rest of your life working on yourself, and people will make you think it's normal. 
People will come to church year, for years and never connect themselves to the vision of the house. Never involve their talents in the kingdom and never win one soul to Christ. And then we're made to feel it's normal. And people in America will consider that it's normal because we're doing what the culture tells us we're to do. But your idea of normal has got to change. We can't get a new harvest on an old paradigm of what normal is. In a nation of the earth where God is moving and where the power of God is flowing, it is not being the anointing and the move of God is not pulpit driven. And what I mean by that is they don't rely solely upon the pastor to get people saved and to share their news. The pulpit in the Christian church is the command center. It's the place to cast vision. It's the place to give direction. But if the people don't run with the vision, it will never happen. If you don't buy into the vision in this house, it'll never happen. If you don't buy into the message of the gospel, it'll never happen. Even churches in America that are growing, they are growing not from all the pulpit ministry alone, but because people have bought into the vision, they have bought into the message of Jesus Christ, and they're doing the ministry of the kingdom. The American culture is entertainment driven where people follow after personalities. And we have allowed that culture to influence the church. And we are running after personalities and running after giftings. Thinking that they will do the work for us. So we won't have to do the work ourselves. And we have become lazy by nature. And only in the Christian church do we do this. The Muslims are growing at an unprecedented rate in America. And they don't have one single revival. They are taking nations. Islam has no famous preachers, no TV evangelists, no tape series, no woman thou art loose, no children's programs, and yet they are taking nations. Why? Because they teach the people to buy into the message and not the method. And we have been infiltrated into our minds that you, to get somebody saved that you have to bring them to church and the preacher has to get them saved. And it, dis, it, it causes there to be a, a, sh, a small funnel in which the whole world has to come through in order to get saved. But I submit to you that you are an evangelist. That if you are a child of God, you ought to get somebody saved this week. Amen. They ought to see enough Jesus in you that they want what you have. And you tell them you don't have to wait till Sunday. You can get it right here, right now. Let's pray this sinner's prayer. You believe it with your heart. You confess it with your mouth. You're saved. And I'll tell you how to get to church on Sunday. And we'll celebrate the goodness of the Lord. My good friend's in Charlotte, and he is, he is transitioning. They bought a, 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 a mall, and they're transitioning that mall into their church, and so they're selling their old building and uh, a few million dollars. And, and he, we're praying and agreeing together for that to happen, and he texts me, and he said, I turned down the, the Buddhist today for full price said good he called me back about a week later he said I turned down the Muslims today 
for full price. He said, these poor saints need to step it up. We've got a poverty mentality. And because we've got a poverty mentality in serving a God that was, is broke, we think we ought not have any resources up in the house of God. But we ought to have more than enough to evangelize our region. Amen. If Muslims in America and Buddhists in America have enough resources to come and pay cash for a few million dollars for a building, it doesn't speak too highly of the body of Christ that says that we are serving a living God. The only way to heaven. And we can't get enough together to save our region. That is not a good reality. The end result to that was Friday he texted me and he said, Got a school, going to come buy it for full price. Amen. You see, I, what I want to tell you today is this, that we've got to have a different perspective of what reality is. The Mormons are growing all over the world and you can't name two Mormon preachers to save your life. Amen? No Mormon manpower. No Mormon anything. They don't even have exciting services. They don't have no praise and worship. They don't have that just old dead songs. And they're growing by leaps and bounds. How is it? Because they believe and bought into the message. They bought into the vision. And they're not waiting upon leadership to do a thing. They're out winning their neighbor. They're out winning their co-worker. They're out telling somebody about their message. Do we believe this message? Without any hoopla, the Mormons have their own city. Salt Lake City. What do you think of when Salt Lake City? Mormons. They got their own newspaper to publish their message. Huh? Because they've been taught to buy into the message. And we've got a lot of people that come to church for the emotional response of the ministry gifts can produce. But outside of the building, they've never been brought, uh, taught to take the message to the people. And they've never believed that the message is more important than the one that delivers it. But I want to tell you, if you'll speak the word of God, it is a living word. And that word will work for you just like it works for me. That word will work for you just like you, you, whoever your, your imagination can think of and your greatest preacher that you can think of in the world. If you'll speak that word by faith, it'll operate just like it does for them because it's not their word, it's his word. And his word will not return into him void, but it will accomplish what has been set out to do. What I'm trying to tell you is if you, we are going to see the harvest come into the Christian church, we must realize what season we are in. And get the weight back on the right people. The kingdom of God will not be established in the earth with the five-fold ministry alone. The five-fold ministry was given for what? For the perfecting of the saints to do the work of the ministry. Huh? And so when we get that back in order, I'm telling you the kingdom of God is going to explode in America. 
The kingdom of God is going to explode in the earth. These gifts have been given for the perfecting of the saints. That's why Islam is growing. That's why Mormonism is growing. They, they, they believe in the message and now the, 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 their people are doing the work of the message. They believe in their message and everyone is doing something to advance the message. My question to us today is this. Have you given yourself over to this 21st century what they call their normal? Have you become comfortable with humanity's wickedness and behavior of demonic influence that it has become normal to us and have no desire to change it? Have we accepted the voice of legion to where we have given in to many voices that are calling for our time and telling us what's important and telling us what, 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 what we should be doing with our time. What is reality? Do we really believe this message? Do we really believe that there is a heaven that is sweet and there is a hell that is hot? Do we really believe that we are living in the last days? Do we really believe that the time that is upon us now is a time that the Lord himself could return very soon? If I believe that, then will I be spending my time on frivolous things? When my brother and my sister and my neighbor are going to hell. If I believe in this message that there is only one way to heaven. And that is through and by the blood of Jesus Christ accepting him as Savior and Lord. If I really believe that. Why am I not telling somebody how they can escape from eternal separation from the presence of God? If somebody was in a burning house and I knew the way to get out of that burning house would I just sit by and watch them burn? Or would I yell into the atmosphere and tell them there is a way out for you? There is a door of escape for you. I, I'm not here to push you down. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to beat you down. I, I've, I've lived in that and, and I understand that doesn't do any good. But what I want to do is to bring you to an awareness and a spiritual awakening. That we are dealing with some things that are real and we can escape those realities or we can come back to the truth of where we are and what is going on and we are now living in the last of the last days. If you believe in dis dispensationalism, then you will begin to hear over this next year about the four blood moons that will line up three of them this year and one of them next year being on Easter. If you believe in dispensationalism and it comes about not as, as some guru religious person has drawn up and conjured up an idea but as the the scientists and astronauts have said that this is what's going to take place and it just so happens that they are on major feast days just so happens and so the the, the heavens are lining up and there is something that is taking place 
The last blood moon was at the end of the six, the six day war. The blood moon before that was when Israel became a nation. There's a shift that was taking place. Amen. In the natural. It reflected in the spirit. And I'm telling you today, if you believe in dispensationalism, then there is an understanding that we are about to see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a reality. A pastor, I've heard that all my life, but you ain't seen the signs you're seeing now. I've heard all my life, you know, we, we, we migrated back, mama's from here, but we, we migrated from Ohio. Whenever you go back to Ohio, I, I head out because the GPS tells me that Akron is 300 miles or whatever, 200 and some miles. And so I head in that direction, but I don't see no signs in Hurricane, no signs in Taze Valley. No signs in Charleston. I don't even see any signs in Marietta. I'm just headed in that direction that I'm supposed to go in. But whenever I get just outside of Canton, I see a sign that says Akron is 40 miles. But I, before I can get through Canton, I see another sign that says Akron is 30 miles. Before I can get into Akron, I see another sign that says Akron is, is 20 miles. Before another Akron is 12 miles. Another Akron is 5 miles. What are you saying? The closer I get to Akron, the more signs that I see. And I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, that we are living in the last of the last days. And so therefore, the more signs that we're seeing, men's hearts are failing them. The young are fainting and growing weary. And we have believed a distorted reality of where we are. And there must be a spiritual awakening within us that says we believe this gospel. We believe in this message. We believe in the vision. And we're not going to sit by and be mute and dumb. But we're going to herald the good news. There is a way of escape. There is an answer. There is a God in heaven that is able to deliver you from the fiery trials of the evil one. You don't have to spend eternity separated from God. But you can live with him forever. See, do we really believe that we're living in the last days and time is short? I can answer that. No, we do not. Because if we did, we wouldn't wait till Sunday. To tell our message. We would tell it everywhere we go. Be weird. I said be weird. Go against the culture. But they'll be glad you did. When they, their life is changed forever. If you're a disciple... If you are a believer of Jesus Christ, 2.4 hours a day belongs to God. Because tithe is not just about money. It's your time, your talent, and your treasures. So my question is, what are you doing with God's time? What are you doing with God's time? Forget your play time. Forget your time. Yes, get on the internet. Yes, get on, do whatever. You know, don't, you don't, you know, avoid your family. You take that time. But what are you doing with God's time? Because two hours and 40 minutes of every day belongs to him. 16.8 hours a week belongs to him 
and we're worried about getting out in an hour. Because most don't come on Wednesday. I seen a commercial on the TV, or not TV, but the internet the other day where a church was bragging about getting you in and out in an hour. If you want to be in and out in an hour, this ain't the church for you. I'm just going to tell you straight up. This ain't it. Because I'm not concerned so much about your time. Your time is valuable. You understand that. But valuing time is not about you getting in and out in an hour. You want that, go to a restaurant. But we're talking about reality, and reality is people are dying and going to hell. And we're worried about if we're going to get out of church on time. And we've become used to that. We've become normal with that. So, well, Pastor, you're being awful rough. No, I'm bringing us to reality. I'm not, I'm not preaching to you today as one standing high in a lofty place, pointing my finger at you and saying you better get it right. I've preached this to me all week. All week. Because as leader of this house, I've got to change some things. I've got to take what is priority and what is reality and I've got to weigh them in the presence of God and say, what does my time, where is it most valuable? What can I do to make my time most effective to make sure that the most people that I can reach before the Lord returns or before I die, my time will be most effective to share the gospel message with the most people to keep them out of hell and cause them to enjoy life here. I'm almost done. But statistics tell us 80% of Christians have never led one person to Christ. That is reality that I'm not willing to live in. I want you to be so secure with your relationship and so bought into this message of the gospel that you're not ashamed to stand in the face of scoffers and mockers and know that your God is real and you can tell them how to experience him in their lives. I know that there's a lot of people that have to have their ego scratched and build their own kingdoms. But I can tell you today, if you don't know it already, I'm not here because I have an ego that needs to be scratched. If I didn't know of certainty that this is what I was created for, I would never do it. But I'm here to advance the kingdom because I bought into this message. And because I believe there is a call upon my life, not just to pastor a church, but to reach a hurting and a bleeding and a dying world with a message that their life don't have to be like this. And I know some, this will make you uncomfortable. And I know some that, that perhaps, you know, the enemy spoke to me all week, said, you're going to run some people off. I'm sorry if, you, if, 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 if that affects you wrong. If, if, if you can't agree with that, I'm sorry that you don't agree. But I'm not going to change it. We have to have a revolution. We have to have a spiritual awakening. And I don't have a voice 
to the world. I don't have a voice to West Virginia, but I have a voice in this region. And I'm going to speak that voice until we can reach the harvest. Because I've got to step it up. And you've got to step it up. And if we'll work together, we'll step it up. And our lives will be changed for his glory and his honor. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand with me today, please. All over this building, just a few moments. God's presence has been here so profoundly today to speak to us. All through our worship and through our time of prayer and through the word. He's just hovering over us to confirm his word. And I don't want to assume today that Everyone here knows Christ as your personal Savior. I don't want to assume that everyone here today is in the relationship that they need to be with God. Maybe you are here today. So, Pastor Brian, you know what? I've drawn cold and indifferent. My relationship's not what it needs to be. Or maybe you've never called upon the Lord to be your personal Savior. You may not agree with my theology, but you cannot deny the presence of God that is right here, right now, touching your life. And if in this atmosphere you're feeling that tugging and that pulling in your heart and you realize the time really is short and I need to get some things right because the reality is I'm not right. I need to get it right. Why would you wait another moment? Why would you wait another day? Why would you wait for anything? If you believe this gospel, if you believe in the message, why would you take the risk of going into eternity lost and undone without God when you have this opportunity to get it right with him? So if you're here today and that relationship's not right, if you're here today and you've never confessed him as Savior and Lord of your life, but right now as he's pulling up on your heart and you sense his presence near you, why don't you just step out of that seat right there and come and stand up here. We've got some elders and we're going to pray with you. And we're going to believe God that, that you don't have to go into eternity lost. You don't have to take the risk or the chance of maybe another day, another time. But right here and right now, while the presence is real in your life, you say, I'm going to get it right, Pastor. I'm going to get it right. I ain't worried about the opinions of people because people can't save me. But right here and right now, I'm just going to give it all to Jesus. And I'm going to make it right with him. Is there anybody? Come on. Come on. I know in my spirit there's some folks here today that it ain't right. You say, well, I'm worried about what people think. It don't matter what people think. Don't allow your reality to be distorted by the opinions of people. Come on. Step out from where you are. I want to meet you. I want to pray with you. Will you do that today? Come on. Come on. Wait another moment because it's real. Reality is real. Time is short. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted hour. How many in this place today have said, Pastor Brian, the Spirit of the Lord is challenging me. Step it up. Today, 
There's some things I want to change. I want to do differently today by God's help and His grace. I want to be that voice. I want to be that witness. I don't want to be ashamed, but I want to be bold in my faith. You say, I haven't been as bold. I haven't been as strong as I should be, but I want to be. I want to be. Hallelujah. I don't know when I've sensed the anointing of God like I sense it right here in this place and I ain't even you know me enough I'm not messing I feel a heavy anointing right here God's anointing is going to if you respond to him he's going to give you boldness he's going to cause you the opinions of people aren't going to matter any longer but you're going to be able to be that witness you've always wanted to be you're going to be that example that you wanted to be because the yokes are being destroyed, the burdens are being removed, and you're saying yes to the Master. You're saying yes to the Gospel. If His Holy Spirit's touched you today, and that's you, and you say, yes, God, yes, I want to be bold. I want to, I want to do what you've called me to do. I want you to step out from where you are. Come and stand in this altar today. We're going to pray as a family together. We're going to believe God to make us bold as we step up before him. That we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Hallelujah. You want control over your time. You say, I realize that my time is being stolen from me. Things that have no eternal value. I've been letting take my time away. But I just don't know how to manage that time. And I want to be a better time manager. God, by your grace, help me to do it. I want you to come today. And I want God to speak into our lives. And I want this place to be a soul winning station. Where that lives are changed on a regular basis. Not on a Sunday basis, but every day kingdom of God is being advanced because we believe in the message hallelujah come on today come on today let's just see what God will do for us I'm going to pastor just a minute. You're going to think it's meddling. But some of you are lying to yourself because if you was bold as you really needed to be, this church couldn't hold the salvation and the lives would be changed on a weekly basis. Amen. I preached a few months ago. This isn't a bad place. The altar isn't somewhere you quit coming to when you're saved. The altar is a place you run to because this is the kingdom of God. This is his presence. This is where in the, or heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. And we're coming to his feet today. We're saying, God, we need you. We need your presence. We need your boldness. We need your power. Hallelujah. Come on, come on.